welcome to a special edition of the Truth Commission Special Report. During the last few days, several reports have been published in South Africa alleging Winnie Marie Gazella Mandela's involvement in the killing of Dr. Abu Bakr Asfat at his Soweto surgery on 27 January 1989. The main source of these new reports is Nicholas Dlamini, presently serving a life sentence for the murder of Dr. Asfat. Dlamini has applied for amnesty from the Truth Commission. The claims in his statement about the murder of Dr. Asfat are similar to those made by Kitiza Kibikulu. Kibikulu was supposed to be a witness at the trial which followed the death of teenage activist Stompy Sipay in 1989. But Kibikulu disappeared and resurfaced later in Zambia. This afternoon, a book called Kitiza's Journey by British journalist Fred Bridgeland was launched in Cape Town. Kibikulu's earlier statements that Winnie Marie Gazella Mandela had ordered the murder of Dr. Asfat are repeated in detail in Bridgeland's book. This afternoon, Mrs. Marie Gazella Mandela held a press conference in ANC headquarters, denying any complicity in the murder. I have watched in painful silence my character being butchered in the media. I have witnessed my contribution to this democracy being vilified and ridiculed. I have seen confused panic in my grandchildren's tearful eyes, attempting to work out whether I am the demon that I am portrayed. I have agonized over the deafening silence of friends who stand and watch with sadistic pleasure over this. I have watched state serial killers receive state pardons. South Africa, I ask, is it public interest or the public's right to know that my name is littered all over the streets of this country, that the media vandalize my dignity without just cause, that ludicrous propositions of complicity in the matter of comrade of a comrade should be based on banal assertions of convicted murderers. When will I enjoy the respect that is accorded everyone? When the brutal machinery of the apartheid government selected me for special treatment and abuse, I understood. When the moral turpitude of the previous government isolated me for depraved slander and propaganda, I understood and persevered. I understood because the truth was to them a heresy and persevered because I believed that the morality of our cause will vindicate all of us. I do not understand when agents in our fledging democracy undermine the structures of the TRC and swap information with the media with a purpose to damage the essence of my being. I do not understand when people who know the truth are mute about these matters. One day, not in the distant future, we will say enough is enough. One day, we will all agree that it is not proper for the country or I to bleed at the hands of power mongers. Comrade Asfat was a personal friend, a family doctor, and a man of deep compassion. He sought me out in Brantford at the risk of torture and imprisonment. He helped me run a clinic for the community of Brantford and surrounding areas. <clears throat> To accuse me of his murder is depravity of a cruel kind. Any journalist or editor worth anything 
would interrogate the veracity of assertions by murderers who did not even bother to apply for amnesty. They did not because theirs was conduct of idiotic criminality and no more. In 1995, I complained through my lawyers to the Commissioner of Police, George Fivers, about this matter and Lamini being tortured by the police to implicate me in the murder of Dr. Aspart. At that time, the media quoted him as saying, the allegations were so serious that they demanded immediate clarification in the interest of Mrs. Mandela and the police. The allegations, if true, would constitute a serious blot on the police and a grave infringement of Mrs. Mandela's personal rights. It is 1997, and I ask, what has become of that investigation? Where is Tebekulu? Is the state machinery unable to get hold of this unsophisticated person so that he tells the truth? He must come home to stand trial he ran away from and to say who helped him leave the country and why. It is not enough to have foreign parliamentarians come and testify before the TRC on issues that they have no factual knowledge of. South Africa demands more. It is the search for the truth. Why are we unable to get to the truth so that my right to fair treatment can be asserted? I intend to testify before the TRC. I intend to bear my soul to the scrutiny of my country. I beg that it be done in public. I beg that these issues be tested by the vigilance of the public. Let this serve as a public spectacle of the last kind. Let me claim the right to decent treatment once and for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight the BBC is broadcasting a documentary narrated by Bridgeland which also contains allegations that Mrs. Mandela participated in the killing of Stumpy Sepe. The documentary will later be broadcast internationally. Because of its global exposure, we feel it is in the public interest to show South Africans what the world is seeing on this issue. We must point out that the contents of this documentary are untested evidence and that it contains a number of subjective interpretations. The sources featured here will face cross-examination when the amnesty applications are heard. The Truth Commission will hear Mrs. Mandela's version of events when she appears before them on the 25th of this month. It will also hear from the convicted leader of the Mandela United Football Club, Jerry Richardson, who is serving a life sentence for Stompy's murder. Let's look now at the BBC's documentary. <laughs> How many people did Winnie kill? Has he ever been in jail for those murders? No. Amanda! If anyone gets into the bad books of Winnie, she can resort to any solution of her choice. Roar, young lions, roar! Now I can say Mrs. Mandela is a murder and a killer of the nation. She's no longer mother of the nation. Winnie Mandela, president of the ANC Women's League in the New South Africa, one of the most famous women in the world. 
This film sheds new light on Winnie and her personal team of bodyguards, known as the Mandela United Football Club. One of its members was Katiza Chebakulu. He vanished seven years ago. Today he has a damning story to tell about Winnie Mandela. There's a sense in which <clears throat> what Katiza has to say confronts the soul of this nation. And usually people who do that end up on, the, on a cross. February 1990, the moment the world had waited for. After nearly 30 years in jail, Nelson Mandela was free, his wife Winnie by his side. Icons of the freedom struggle, partners in a great love story, their destiny was to set their people free. Nelson in prison was more mythical than real. Winnie was the visible, living symbol of black resistance. Especially when, in 1986, the apartheid government declared a state of emergency. As South Africa edged towards civil war, she remained defiant. This is now the right time to take your country we shall use the same language the Boers are using against us. They know only one language, the language of the Caspers. We have no, no arms. We have stones. We have boxes of matches. We have hot Amidst the chaos, black communities were gripped by tension and mistrust. It was horrific black-on-black -black violence. Alleged informers were hacked or burnt to death. It was in these anarchic times that Winnie recruited young men for her bodyguard. The football club appeared glamorous, but was in fact a mafia ruling by violence and intimidation. The club became infamous when linked to the murder of Stompy McKetsy. The key witness to Stompy McKetsy's last hours was Katiza Chebakulu. But he was abducted from South Africa before he could tell his story. He speaks for the first time from his place of exile, thousands of miles from home, about the inside story of Winnie Mandela and her football club. His story is extraordinary, as is his journey. It all began in 1988, when Katiza left his home in Zululand. I just fed up the violence. I bought the, the, the train to Johannesburg. I didn't have money. As soon as the train started to move, the tears come out. The tears come full in my eyes, because I'm thinking, where I'm going? I've never been to Johannesburg. Where am I going to sleep? Park Station, Johannesburg, the city of gold. It was here that Katiza arrived, as have countless other Zulu migrants. Unsure where to turn, he followed a black commuter and bought a ticket for a suburban train. Little did he know it, but he would be sucked into the heart of a tragedy concerning South Africa's foremost family. The train took him to Orlando, in the huge black township of Soweto. He wandered the streets, looking for somewhere to stay. Then came a fateful encounter. I explained, I, I come from Natal, where there's violence, I don't have place to stay, I don't have nobody. So he, say, he put me inside, he went and handed me over to higher authorities. So that's why I meet Mrs. Mandela. 
She was my first time to see her. Winnie Mandela was widely hailed as the mother of the nation. She was renowned for her courage and indomitable spirit. And in the 1970s, she became a martyr when the white government banished her to a remote town called Branford. She was callously treated. On return to Soweto in 1985, it was as a heroine. Senator Edward Kennedy said she was a source of inspiration. She built the Mandela United Football Club. With thousands of youths fleeing the security police, there was no shortage of recruits. Winnie's commander-in-chief of the football club was Jerry Richardson. He idolised her and commanded the bodyguard from her house here in Soweto. She introduced me to Richardson. He was in charge for the house. She introduced me to slash shoes and other boys. Since I, not get, I didn't have the clothes for wear, I needed to give me the track suit for Mandela United. <laughs> They wrote it in the back, Mandela United football team. The football club rarely kicked a ball. A law unto itself, it ruled amid the anarchy of the time. Winnie presided as it made arrests, interrogated people and dispensed street justice. It is our joy and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, you created all things... And Working in the heart of Soweto was Paul Farain. He was compassionate and widely loved. Farain's church, also in Soweto, provided a similar refuge to Winnie's football club for youths fleeing the security police. God bless Africa. God her children, guide her leaders, and give her peace. It was on December. Mrs. Mandela called me. She said, please, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what favor? I said, go to Paul's house. You tell Paul that you don't have a place to sleep. If he upset you, you try and sleep with him in the same bed. The next morning, you should tell the secretary for Paul Verin, Paul is Afalat, that Paul raped you. When he hated Paul Verin, Katiza said she was jealous. Jealous of his popularity, jealous of the funds he received from anti-apartheid groups. She saw Verin as a rival and set out to destroy him. He became the target of an elaborate plot devised by Winnie. What he order you do, you do it. Winnie have that strong African medicine because you can't look her in the eyes like this. No, when you talk with her, you need to put your head down. You know, you have that scare that, you know, is strong. Everybody, they're afraid for. Paul Ferrain gave Katiza refuge. We stay in the house. The time for sleep, I used to sleep with these other boys. So about two, two days, I stayed with Paul. I complained that I'm not sleeping good with these other boys. So we are too squeezed. So Paul suggested let me come and sleep in his bedroom. So I sleep with Paul's bedroom. I've been wearing a, a underwear. Paul wear a pyjama. He didn't do nothing. Early in the morning, I woke up. I went outside. I cried. Paul said, what happened? I didn't say nothing. I didn't talk. Paul went inside and sleep. When Paul had gone, I told Paul his father, the housekeeper, that Paul Verin, he raped me. The housekeeper contacted her friend, Winnie Mandela, and took Katiza to see her. Mrs. Mandela, she pretended like she never knew me before. Me, I pretend like I don't know Mrs. Mandela. I never hear about them. As soon as she's in the house, she asks, this is the boy, Collis, she say yes. He said, tell me what happened. 
I explain, I say, I'm staying with Paul Verren. At night, Paul, he raped me. So Mrs. Mandela, I asked the housekeeper, Paul Isofala, that the other, you think the other boys in the house, they are being sodomized by Paul Verren? Paul she agreed. He said, yes. He said, name them. He named Stompy, Kenneth Hase, Pilomewe, Tabisomono. When his sting was now in full flow, football club members were sent to abduct the youths from Verain's church on the 29th of December, 1988. With the others, he was hustled through the house to rooms here in Winnie's back courtyard. Among the youths was the 14-year-old activist, Stompy McKetsy. They were met by Winnie. She says, I say, you dogs, do you sleep with the European? You let them fuck you dogs. You stomp, you walk with the police, you a spy. So Mrs. Mandela started to beat them. Mrs. Mandela. She was the first one to start beating us one by one with fist. She asked us to come to her one by one and ask you, why are you sleeping with a white reverend? And then a minute you said you wanted to, uh, to, to, to answer, then she started beating you. So we were screaming a lot and they were singing in, the, in that room while we were being beaten. Mrs. Mandela began to shambok us. And we were shambled for, 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 for quite a long time. I took part on the beating. I didn't hit him too much. Why me I hit? Because all they were hitting. If I don't hit, they'll hit me too. Katiza take to the, the, the shambok and he hit me on my head with, with the back of the shambok. One guy came in with a, a big bottle of Coca-Cola and hit us on our knees. But by then we had already confessed to sleeping with being raped by a white reverend because we, we, we couldn't afford the beating any, more, any longer. And then also I hand over the shambok to Mrs. Mandela. And then the whip, a whip stompy, whip stompy, whip stompy. We are singing. Uh, this is uh, a song for freedom that the neighbor, they cannot hear the noise for the, for the crime of stomping. Mrs. Mandela left Stompy and Richardson, they left him up, they dropped him several times. And then on the cement, in the concrete, in Mrs. Mandela's back room, like cement like this, now they hit him there with a bag and the head, until the head comes cool like this soft, that the eyes, they were small, they were bleeding all year. Miss Mandela whipped stomp until the, the jambok break, until the stomp be faint. The next day, leaving Stompy and the others at her house, Winnie drove with Katiza to see her friend and personal doctor, Abu Bakr Asfat. The date, the 30th of December 1988, is of critical importance in this story. Dr. Asfat, a radical activist, ran a clinic in Soweto. For her sting against Ferrain to succeed, Winnie needed Dr. Asfat's help. When we need to Dr. Asfat, he said, Well, what can I do being visited by big people like this? We make like it's a joke first, we we'll laugh. He said, I'm here, doctor, I have a problem. I just brought this boy in being sodomized by Paul Ferrain. So Dr. Asfat said, Oh, really? Come inside. So, doctor, you only take the blood. You only take me the blood, that's all. Asfat said there was no physical evidence of rape. When he refused to collude with Winnie, a row ensued. So there was some arguing noise, you know, like somebody to talk loud. You say, no, I'm not going to do this, this and this. We have that small argument. So when they come out in the door, we went without the medical report. Dr. Ashford, they said, well, you have nothing to do. So we went home without the medical report. 
without the medical certificate, police would not act against Paul Ferrand. And without a police investigation, Winnie could not discredit him. Well, it was as if there was a quite specific plan to eliminate me, um, if not my physical person, uh, certainly to eliminate any cause for me to carry on being. So it was like killing somebody and then forcing them to carry on living their life. Back at Winnie's, Stompy and the other terrified youths were under guard. The effects of the previous night's beatings were seen by Katiza. Stompy, he could not see. The eyes, they were small. The eyes. The head was soft. I want, he asked water to drink. I wanted to give him the cup. He can't even even hold the cup. Mrs. Mandela said we should not give them nothing. We should not give them food. We should not give them water. She contacted Dr. Asfad again and sent the boys to be patched up at his surgery. A close friend of Dr. Asfad was Reggie Jana. He reveals for the first time his private conversations with his friend, also known as Hurley. Stompy was in such pains that he was bitter towards Winnie Mandela. And, he's, and according to Hurley, he says, Stompy, he says, that fucking bitch and the henchman, he says, they beat me to this pulp. Asfat told Winnie there was nothing he could do. Stompy and the other youths must be taken to hospital immediately. Winnie refused, and the next day she summoned Asfat to her house. When Hurley arrived at Winnie's residence and saw the four youngsters, he was shocked, you know, that they were, the condition had deteriorated so badly. Stompy and the others were never taken to hospital. Later that night, the 31st of December, Katiza saw the brutal stabbing of Stompy Maketsi. In Mrs. Manila's house in the back room, there's a sliding door. In the middle is jacuzzi. At this side is another room with a toilet outside. So when I finished peace, you know, need to go inside. I hear the noise, like somebody crying in the steps. So when I see, her, I saw Mrs. Mandela, because it had those small trees, flower, on near to the jacuzzi. I saw Mrs. Mandela wearing long clothes. How I knew it was Mrs. Mandela, I know I, there was a moon, not that full moon, not that the moon that you can see. The, this is the woman. This is the man. This is the boy. She was holding something in a shining night knife. And Richardson was coming with other people. I didn't see them proper. They were near to the swimming pool, to the jacuzzi. I saw Mrs. Mandela holding something shining. He, he used their hands twice. Soon as I see that, I come scared. Witness to the stabbing next to this jacuzzi, Katiza crept back to his bed. In about 10 minutes, I hear the, the noise for the car going out. In about in one hour, the car, he came back. The football club's driver, John Morgan, was given an order by Winnie. She said, look, you better drive that red uh, Toyota car out. Then I asked her to do what with it. She said to take that uh, body of that dog and dump it away. I said, I'm not going to do that. However, the body was removed and dumped on waste ground. It is not known by whom. Police found the rotting corpse, later identified as Stompy's. The autopsy found two deep stab wounds to the right side of the neck and another at the base.
security police hounded Dr. Asfat to reveal what he knew about the youth's injuries. He stayed silent, told anything to the security police and he would be branded an informer. So there was continuous pressure put onto Hurley by Winnie Mandela to say, look, hey, you're not making any statement of any nature. So Hurley was, Hurley was being, what he called, uh, pestered by Winnie Mandela, by the security police, and he just didn't know which side to turn. He says, this effing bitch is giving me grief, causing problems, and I fear for my life. Within days, two Zulu youths were brought here to Winnie Mandela's house. She asked they be shown the location of Dr. Asfat's surgery. Their guide was Katiza. Well, no other two people came to the house. Uh, the, Ms. Mandela said, let me show them the house for Dr. Asfat. We went to Rockville, the surgeon. I showed them the house. Soon after, two youths entered the surgery and registered as patients. Two shots were fired. Four weeks after examining Stompy in this very same room, Dr. Asfat lay dead on the floor. The funeral ceremonies were led by Dr. Asfat's elder brother, Ibrahim. Police swiftly said the motive for the murder was robbery. Ibrahim does not accept this explanation. As far as we were concerned, the robbery was not the motive. We found all, most of the money still in these consulting rooms. Two Zulu youths were arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder. We were given a statement in court by the then uh, prosecuting attorney, uh, attorney. He showed me a document and gave me a photocopy of it, which stated that uh, they had been promised 20,000 rand for the murder of my brother, for the killing of my brother. And the statement said, which was never produced in court, that Mrs. Mandela had, uh, uh, had offered this money. It was never used in court. It's an unsigned document. One of the youths, Nicholas Lamini, has just issued a statement from prison confirming that Katiza Chebakulu showed him Dr. Asfat's surgery and that Winnie Mandela hired him and an accomplice to assassinate the doctor. Our witnesses, Katiza Chepakulu and Reggie Jana, say the opposite was true, that in fact he refused to substantiate her allegations. Winnie and the football club were now under close scrutiny. In mid-February 1989, police raided Winnie's house and arrested Jerry Richardson, her chief bodyguard, for the murder of Stompy McKetsey. Richardson was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death, commuted to life imprisonment. Winnie's football club was now falling into disrepute. Nevertheless, she continued recruiting. When one youth, Sibu Sisu Chili, refused to join, a fight broke out and a football club member, Maxwell Madondo, was killed. Winnie demanded revenge. Katiza Chebakulu heard her give the order. Now, Ms. Mandela called the meeting. He said that she go and pay the revenge because they've killed uh, Maxwell Madondo. So we should go in revenge for this. The target was the Chile family. Their house was machine gunned and fire bombed. Dudu Chile's 13 year old niece, Finky, was shot. I hope before she was burned, she, she was dead. I hope so. Because if she started by burning, she has died a cross. <laughs> She was too young. 
shed a bright future. Sibu Sisu Chile could not have imagined his refusal to join Mandela United would end in such tragedy. Today he's too traumatized to talk. As for my, the attack on my house, the orders came from Winnie. And nothing has ever happened to her. But joining the football club was no guarantee of safety. Lolo Sono, the only son of this Soweto family, was keen to be a club member. But Lolo got on the wrong side of Winnie. He disappeared nine years ago. Teza has never heard the Sono family's version of the story. He reveals his for the first time. Lolo Sono accused him of being a police spy. So they put him in the house. He says he's not a police spy. They say work with the police. Lolo Sono was taken to Winnie Mandela's house. Behind these garage doors, she passed judgment. When I came in the, in the garage, they were beating Lolo Sono, Mrs. Mandela and Jill Richardson and others. They are whipping Sono. After they beat Sono, he was wounded. From then, they put him in the car. They drive to his house in Midlands. Mrs. Mandela and football club members took Lolo to his home to search for documents Winnie believed would prove the boy's guilt. No such documents existed. Inside the kumbi, there was my boy Lolo. He's been held by two boys. He was badly beaten. His face was bruised up. And I spoke to Winnie concerning what happened. She told me Lolo was a spy. The father, for Lolo Son, he talked with Mrs. Mandela that, please, if you can leave my son with me, that is the only way I remember. Mrs. Mandela said, no, I'm taking her away with me. The movement will see what to do with him. I was pleading with Winnie, please give my son back to me. Because if you accuse him of being a police spy, I don't believe it's incorrect. She said to me, I'm taking the dog away, the movement, We'll see what to do with him. The last time I saw Lolo, he was in the presence of Mrs. Mandela, not in the presence of a man that I didn't know, but in the presence of the woman that I, for one, and many of us called a mother of the nation. A woman who used to come and sit in my bedroom, talk to my husband in this very bedroom behind my back. Now I can say Mrs. Mandela is a murder and a killer of the nation. When Mrs. Mandela I said take him away, that means it's the end. Like the way they take stomp, when they take somebody, say take him away, that is to kill. I wanted to give me my dog back, as she called Lolo. To me it's not a dog, to her is a dog. Now my reply to her is I want that dog that you took away. I want it back. The dog is mine. As she claimed, as she called Lolo a dog, I want the dog back. I want to bury it. I think he's dead. This is Mandela. The Sono family want Winnie Mandela brought to account. As yet, no charges have been laid against anyone in connection with the disappearance of Lolo Sono. Events linked with all these deaths and disappearances were witnessed by Katiza. He was stuck in a morass of violence, lies and betrayals. Then, one day, while snooping around Winnie's house, Teaser made a startling discovery in one of the bedrooms. When I opened the drawer, I got shocked. I didn't believe what I see. I saw a lot of pictures. The picture they were made, when I look at the picture, they were Mrs. Mandela with Dalian Pofu. Dalian Pofu was a young lawyer who became Winnie's lover while Nelson Mandela was in prison. And Pofu later plays a critical role in this story. 
Who shot the pictures Katiza found remains a mystery. That is on, you, that you know when I think, one picture I hold Mrs. Mandela. You can see this is Mrs. Mandela, but you cannot see the back for the man. You can see this is the man lying on top of the woman. You can see the face for the woman in the back. This is the woman, but you cannot see the man. So there are a lot of pictures from Mrs. Mandela naked. I take one of the picture. When I take the picture, I didn't know what to do with it. I hide the picture. Unwisely, Katiza confided his discovery to another club member. The photo of Winnie and Dali naked together in bed would put his life in danger. In February 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from his long imprisonment. But Winnie's troubles were growing. And seven months later, she was formally charged with assaulting Stompy Maketsi. Among those charged with her was Katiza. He let it be known he would tell the truth at Winnie's trial and blow apart her defence. Soon after, Katiza was tipped off that Winnie had given the order to kill him. Katiza jumped bail and went on the run. Arrested later, he expected to be jailed. Incredibly, the police instead delivered him to Winnie Mandela. They put him in the back room where they put Stompy. So they tied me. They tied me the hands. They tied me the food. So Mrs. Mandela came. He asked me, he said, where's the picture? I said, I have destroyed it. So they beat me. So Mrs. Mandela said, let them boil hot water. All the face here, even the head. Well, boom, born here in the head, all here, and even the party, all down the leg, in the teeth, they were broken because the way they knock me, they hit me all here, Mrs. Mandela, with these other bodyguards. The teeth, some they were. The, the teeth, the back? Yes, yeah, yeah, like this. You see? All, yeah. Mrs. Mandela beat me. That I didn't even feel the pain. I cried until I didn't feel the pain. The way they beat his stomp, I started to have that memo. They grabbed me, they put him in the put of the motor car. Although badly beaten, Teaser regained consciousness and somehow managed to kick open the boot and escape. After hospital treatment, he took refuge with Winnie's driver, John Morgan, a co-accused in the trial whom he thought he could trust. In a blaze of publicity, Winnie Mandela's trial began at the Supreme Court in Johannesburg. Teaser, one of the co-accused, was absent from the dock, in hiding. There was an instant adjournment to give Winnie more time to prepare her defence. During this break, Morgan took Katiza into central Johannesburg, to a place he had never been before, Shell House the national headquarters of the newly legalized ANC. Caught in a trap, Katiza was ushered into a room. When they checked ten, it was Mrs. Mandela. We meet face to face. I wanted to run, to open the door and run. It was too late. When I turned, I didn't see Morgan. So I just get confused, scared. He said, no, take a seat. I sit down. So how are you? I say, I'm fine. With that scared, because I don't know what's going to happen now. He said, did you tell the police? I say, no. He said, listen, Gatism, you need to choose two things. I carry you to Switzerland. I give you education, house, everything you stay there if you don't agree you tell me i'll deal with you right now anc security immediately smuggled katiza to swaziland he was passed on through anc bases in mozambique and angola to 
to Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. Here, Zambian intelligence took charge. There was no education as promised by Winnie. For a house, Katiza was given a cell here, in one of Africa's most notorious prisons, Lusaka Central. Katiza was lost to the world. Some foreign correspondents, including me, believed he had evidence that would have been critical at Winnie's trial. I began to search for him. Rumour said he was in Zambia. And when I went to Lusaka in 1991 to report the presidential election, I made a breakthrough. I met British MP Emma Nicholson, there as an election observer. Emma Nicholson was a friend of the new president, Frederick Chaluba. When he invited her to see him just two days after taking office, I urged her to ask about Katiza Chebakulu. I said, but there's an international problem, a humanitarian gesture that you could make. You could do something wonderful today. He said, what? I said, find a missing prisoner, somebody who's nothing to do with Zambia, who didn't commit a crime here as far as I understand, who I believe is in Lusaka jail. He said, I'm sure he's not here. We don't have people like that. I said, I think he may be. And he said, well, all right, if you insist, I'll send out a telephone call. You go away and come back later. After six months, I was in the prison. They just came the commander inside the prison. They said, well, I should dress. They want to see me. What I didn't know where I was going. So I just, I didn't know they were going to free me or they are going to kill me, or they are going to hand over me to win. I didn't know. The president himself came on the line. Come back, Emma, at once. I found your man. I am astonished that he's here. You've got to come and listen to what he's got to say. Katiza Chabakulu wanted to tell his story. It was obvious that he never thought he would have a chance of telling it. This chance was there. He took it with both hands and he poured the whole tale out of how he had been, as it were, a houseboy in Winnie Mandela's household and what he had seen her do. And with graphic illustration, raising his arm in the air, he brought it down with thrusts like that, saying, I saw Mrs. Mandela do that to Stompy. And the room went silent. The president believed Katiza would be in danger from Winnie Mandela if freed in Zambia. Emma Nicholson worked to find a safe haven for him elsewhere. As a temporary measure only, Katiza was sent back to prison for his own safety. In South Africa, meanwhile, Winnie Mandela was found guilty of kidnapping Stompy Maketsi and being an accessory to assault. She was condemned to six years in prison, but on appeal her sentence was reduced to a mere £3,000 fine. In his summing up, Justice Stegman had this to say. She showed herself on a number of occasions to be a calm, composed, deliberate and unblushing liar. Despite this, Nelson Mandela stood by his wife. I have never believed that um, she was guilty of assaulting anyone. And the judgment of the court has confirmed that position. In Zambia, Katiza was still in prison. But in South Africa, his countrymen were free at last. In May 1994, the black majority voted for the first time. Nelson Mandela was elected state president. I, Nelson Hodesasa Mandela, do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. Will you please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God.
While South Africa celebrated, Emma Nicholson continued a prolonged struggle to find sanctuary for Kapitiza Chepakulu. Every country that is an active signatory of the human rights agenda was approached. And everyone turned them down. John Major turned him down, despite my personal pleadings. And far more importantly, despite the fact that this was human rights, asylum seeker material, without a shadow of doubt. It took Emma Nicholson three years to find a country that would take Katiza. Now in his seventh year of exile, we filmed him thousands of miles from South Africa. We showed Katiza film clips of the many faces of Winnie Mandela denying her involvement in any crimes. The clips included a speech to Parliament by the new ANC Deputy Minister of Culture and Science. My deepest regret is that I failed Stompy, that I was unable to protect him from the anarchy of those times, and he was taken from my house and killed. Who killed him? Who killed this the one who killed, killed Stompy? Who took him in your arms and going and killed Stompy? The terror of intolerance and the injustice of the kangaroo courts. I am astounded that political loyalties could not stand a simple test that it could even be dreamt that I would be responsible for the murder she killed she knows you killed when I have spent all my life fighting against these injustices appalls me I feel betrayed the ultimate humiliation by my own people this surely is not the South Africa I ruined my life for. It cannot be. I am not guilty of any crime. You guilty what because if you are not guilty, why I'm here? You. Why must I be treated this way by the world media and the local media? This small town, 200 miles from Soweto, was one good reason why. At her trial, Winnie swore under oath she was here in Branford throughout the assaults on Stompy. Despite his doubts, the judge accepted her alibi. Katiza Chabakulu alleges the Branford alibi was manufactured by Winnie Mandela's lover, Dalian Pofu. I asked Katiza if he was approached by Mpofu. Yes. They say, well, Mrs. Mandela is coming, he's not here. I should say that they were in Brantford on that day for the beating of Stomp. He was not in Orlando, they were out. So he reminded me for that, that I should not forget in court that on December 29, Mrs. Mandela was in Brantford from 29, 30, 31. John Morgan, Winnie's driver, said at her trial that she was in Branford. He admits he lied. Well, we are merely lying there, all of us, trying to defend Mrs. Mandela. I actually wanted to report the matter to the police, but I thought that Winnie's comrades were going to crush me or kill me. So I decided not to say anything, just keep my gap shut. If Winnie Mandela went to Brantford, then on December the 30th, she was away all that day. She was 200 miles away. Are you sure you saw her on December the 30th in Soweto? Yes. Because on December 29th, the day they call it Stompy. On December 30th, the time I went to see Dr. Ashford. So Ms. Mandela, she's lying. If she was in 200 miles away from Johannesburg, who came me to Dr. Ashford? Because when I went to Dr. Ashford, I came with Mrs. Mandela. Winnie said she visited Dr. Ashford with Katiza on the 29th of December 1988, before driving to Branford. But 
But this medical card for the visit was stamped the 30th of December. People who could have confirmed the card's accuracy and importance were not subpoenaed. One was Dr. Asfat's brother, Ibrahim. The date which is depicted here is correct. You know, because this I verified on my on the record books as well as the patients were entered into the into the record books. That also stated it was the 30th of December 1988. Albertina Sisulu, one of the ANC's best loved leaders. She was also Dr. Asfat's receptionist and could have given decisive evidence at Winnie's trial. She was never called to testify. Mama Sisulu just didn't want to be implicated in this whole episode of Stompy. I mean, if she got involved or she exposed as to what had happened, I mean, she would have definitely impl implicated Winnie Mandela. And that would have caused friction between the Sisulu and the Mandela camp. Despite her fears, she talked about it for the first time since Winnie Mandela's trial. Is that your writing on the top there? That's my handwriting. And is that Dr. Asfat's writing? This is his writing. And that date there, is that the date you would have stamped? Yes, I was, yes. What I was doing is just to dispense the cards and stamp, uh, put the stamp. That would be the correct date, would it? I should think so, because I wouldn't just put any other date if it's not the, 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 the right date. You would query it or correct it. So you're certain that's the correct date? That was the correct date. Why did so many support her false alibi? Particularly Jerry Richardson, now serving life for Stompy's murder. He seems Mandela was in Bradford when he knew when he was in the house. So he still protects Win, even if they have sentenced him to death, he still protects Win. But why? We asked Jerry Richardson's defense counsel. How convinced were you that Jerry had lied to protect others? I was convinced of it. I was convinced that, that, that he lied to protect others. And how circumstantial was the evidence against him? Nobody actually saw Jerry take Stompy away uh, that night. So to that extent, it was circumstantial. But uh, when the question of his sentence came up, it would perhaps have been wiser for him to tell the truth. And why do you think he was holding back? Well, he was protecting people. Who? Well, the only one that was involved in the affair was, was Winnie, Winnie Mandela. More deeply so than, than anybody admitted during the trial. Kulu had been brought to Zambia by Kit So was Katiza Chebakulu consigned to oblivion because he would no longer play Winnie's game? Winnie's hold over ordinary people was awesome. But her protection may have gone far higher than the mere foot soldiers, as both President Chaluba and Emma Nicholson found out. Katiza Chebakulu had been brought to Zambia by kidnapping through a number of countries, as he told us, including Mozambique, by some members of the ANC, the African National Congress. The ANC had a well-established route from South Africa to Zambia for ferrying people either to safety or to banishment. As Katiza's legal guardian, Emma Nicholson confronted Zambia's former president about this allegation and about his own involvement. 
Uh, did Nelson tell you why he wanted Katiza Chabakulu here and out of South Africa? No, really, he didn't. He didn't give you any reason? He didn't give me any reason at all. What, what I did was to work on trust. What Nelson told me, to me, was uh, the, 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 the thing to do. How did you get the message? Ah, <laughs> that came through Oliver Tambo. Hmm? Oliver Tambo. Oliver Tambo. Uh -huh. And he said that Nelson, Nelson Mandela that wants this man out of South Africa. Yes, and, and we worked on that, yes. In the context of those years, it's possible that the Zambian government would have assumed Nelson Mandela's direct involvement. But we asked President Mandela if this was true. This week, his office told us that, for the record, the president wishes to make it clear that he did not arrange for Mr. Chebekulu to be taken from South Africa to Zambia or to be incarcerated there. What is surprising me, he's the president for the country. He knows the case. Since he's in power now, she gave power to stop the police, give me freedom. So I'm begging the president, Mandela, if you allow me to return back home. Back home, Winnie Mandela remains an icon, however tarnished and tawdry, still seen by some as the mother of the nation, by others as its mugger, still defiant, still, despite everything, free and without shame. Meanwhile, Katiza Chebekulu is still in exile, unsafe, a sacrificial lamb for Winnie Mandela. It's why Katiza has told his story. He now wants it presented to the South African authorities. Emma Nicholson is helping prepare an affidavit. In the middle of the garage, lying on the concrete floor, yes, it was, was Lolo Serna. He had his arms wrapped around his head. He seemed to be trying to protect himself by covering his skull with his hands and forearms. Mrs. Mandela was beating him savagely. She had a heavy whip in her right hand, which she was using to hit him with again and again. Is that correct? Yes. Katiza Chebakulu's fate is unclear. Will the South African authorities now allow him to return home safely, or will he be forced to remain in exile? How will Winnie Mandela answer Katiza Chebakulu's grave allegations? The government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission is investigating the matter. President Mandela told us that he fully supports the current processes initiated by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to establish the truth of the allegations which it appears are also being dealt with by your television documentary. Winnie Mandela refused to speak to us. She has been subpoenaed to give evidence to the Commission later this month. So will there finally be justice for those who feel they and their loved ones are the victims of crimes committed by Winnie Mandela? My wish is if Mrs Mandela can be brought to justice and be prosecuted and spend the rest of her life in prison. I don't wish her dead. I wish her to suffer. The world has to know what type of a monster this woman is. A woman, a mother who knows the pain of giving birth. But for her, it was just easy to kill other women's children. I think that the last years have proved that she will never go anywhere without questions being asked about Stompy, whether she hears those or whether she doesn't. The death of this youth activist continues to be a question next to her name. I don't think about it as a scrap if Katiza Chepakulu doesn't go to South Africa. But I'll go for him if he doesn't wish to, or if it's not safe for him to go. 
just to make sure that South Africa knows what was done by Mrs. Winnie Mandela. She should go down for life. They're not going to forget. That evidence is going to be theirs. My argument is Mrs. Mandela to be tried again for murder for Stompy because it's been fine for kidnap. You need to be tried for the murder for Stompy. If it's me I'm lying, I should be punished. If it's Win lying, it should be punished. Because when she came is innocent. I claim when she's guilty.